Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football, presented by Adam Lowy of the Lowy Law Firm. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined this morning by Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton. We have a lot to talk about. We're going to take your questions, but first, tell us where you're checking in from, what you're drinking this morning. Obviously, we love to see that. Love to see where y'all are tuning in from around the world. And uh, guys, practice resumed yesterday. Sark met with the media. He said quite a bit in a short amount of time. What was your takeaways? Well, I mean, uh, the big news for, for a lot of people, including myself, was the uh, praise of Ryan Wingo. I don't think there's any doubt that that was a big piece of it. Um, he mentioned of all the freshmen standing out right now, Wingo, the freshman out of St. Louis, uh, was the guy to watch right now for him, at least that's caught his eye. Now, obviously, he doesn't see as much of the defense, uh, but I think that uh, when we went to that very first practice, Jerry, you and I walked out of there together and said, Ryan Wingo has a chance to be special. Yeah. Okay. And the fact that he's mentioning him now, um, seven practices in, Jerry, means he hasn't hit the wall. Right. That's what that means to me. Um, and so I, I said this uh, when we first got started back when I saw him. He is the best looking and most talented wide receiver prospect that Texas has signed since Roy Williams. Now, I understand that Xavier Worthy is likely a first round draft pick. OK, there is a different Xavier Worthy was never going to be a top five pick, though. He's too right. small. Right. Well. Ryan Wingo's many things. He's not too small, um, yet he can play small. He's 6'2", 195, 200 pounds, right? Um, yet he also has 10, 5, 100 meter speed. He has great ball skills. He has good movement skills. Like I said, he's the most prototypical top potential pick, higher than Jonte Cook. I, I like Jonte, don't get me wrong, but just a different caliber. Right. Yeah. Dante's not going to be a top five, top 10 yeah. NFL draft pick. Yeah. Wingo might be. I'm not saying he will be, but he might be because he has that kind of uh, ability uh, and, uh, you know, juice, I guess, for lack of a better term. I also uh, really uh, enjoyed what uh, Sark had to say about the development of Quinn Ewers uh, yesterday. Jerry when he, and uh, Blake, when he talked about that, I, I felt like it's exactly what we discussed when we saw him in person at the media or at the uh, availability, you could just sense a different level of maturity from the young man from South Lake. I just, uh, it was palpable in my opinion. And I think he's starting to show that to the team as well. Yeah. So I think the thing here with Wingo uh, before we play that to remember is um, he is going to be a tremendous, but at wide receiver at Texas, it's how much of the playbook, can Sark put on him in game situations? So he's he's going to be a standout this spring. He already has been. Um, he'll make a, another move before August, right, in terms of grasping concepts and everything within that offense. But, again, you have a year three starting quarterback and an experienced offensive line. So how much Ryan Wingo plays is going to really depend on how much of the playbook that Steve Sarkeesian thinks he can handle. Because there's a lot of pre-stat movement. There's a lot on the plate of a wide. Uh -oh. He's a ex just talent. And his ceiling, it's about as high as you get. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll see wh where he's at with that playbook come September. Cameron Parker with three shots of espresso. Man, <laughs> wake up, Cameron. Ooh. I don't know if I can do that. I've got a, a little Starbucks uh, cinnamon uh, blend this morning, guys. Let's let's listen to Blake. Let's listen to uh, Steve Sarkeesian if you've got that queued up, and you can hear what he's talking about here about Quinn Ewers. I really, really am. Uh, I'm starting to believe in Quinn taking that next step as a leader this year. I I think so. I think Quinn's really enjoying his time right now, and that's how you should be in year three. You know, when you, um, you know, I referenced this about Xavier a year ago that it looked like he was having the most fun he had had in his three years and being here, you know, after year one, just hard charge and trying to get on the field year two for Xavier, you know, was a little up and down. He had the broken hand was dropping some balls. He felt a little of that year three kind of came in with a renewed you know, kind of 
joy for the game and with his teammates. Uh, and I feel that with Quinn, like he really enjoys his teammates. I think he really enjoys the challenge of getting that rapport with the receivers. I think he's got great rapport with this offensive lineman uh, and those runners. But now what's that rapport like with those wide outs, with the new tight end, working with Gunner and, and Amari and that group. So I think he's enjoying it. The, the fun part for me is I get to keep coaching him hard, you know, and I get to keep coaching him hard on stuff that maybe I wasn't as hard on him with in the past. But that's how you keep pushing a guy uh, to, to be the best that he can be. And um, he's taking the coaching, you know, and, and he's playing at a really high level for us right now. I, I tell you what, they, we look, look like we lost Jerry. Jerry's on the road right now, guys, by the way, uh, back in his car. <laughs> but actually, I think he's in a hotel room. He's got a couple of different places he's stopping at today, including a track meet uh, up in Duncanville, Waxahachie area. That's going to have Duncanville, DeSoto. Uh, a lot of those guys at it. You'll see DeCorey and more. Uh, but uh, to, to speak back to, uh, we'll wait for Jerry to return, but to, to get back to what we were talking out there with Sark and uh, Quinn Ewers, I'm telling you guys, think about the 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 movement that Xavier Worthy, which is who uh, Sark compared it to, his movement from his sophomore season to his junior season. Th think about mentally, Oh, he dropped some passes. Oh, he was injured. Oh, it seemed like it seemed like it was a little bit of let me say this the right way, guys. A little bit of an excuse riddled sophomore season for Xavier Worthy. Those those excuses turned out to be legitimate, by the way. Not unlike Quinn Ewers and his injury, right? Except he plays a different uh, different position, so he couldn't get away from it. My point being is if we see that same level of rise from Worthy as a sophomore to Worthy as a junior in Quinn Ewers this year, how much better quarterback do you get? I mean, that like what is the ceiling there? What is the value there? I, mean, I, I don't know. But I, I, if I'm a Longhorn fan, I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my point. It's like, give it to me because I think then – uh, you're talking about a, a quarterback-led team for the first, really for the first time in S Steve Sarkeesian's time at Texas. He'll have a quarterback-led team next year. I mean, that's we haven't seen that yet. We saw it at Bama. We haven't seen it here. Is my connection any better, guys? Much better, Jerry. Much better. Okay, so so for those who don't know, I'm at the Days Inn in Rockdale. So you know, look, it's been a uh, had a little bit of a road trip yesterday. Um, I, I was at Belleville High School, which uh, I'm, we'll, we'll get to that. I saw DJ Sanders yesterday. Got another stop here uh, before I head up to a big-time uh, district track meet just south of Dallas. But sorry for any connections issue. It's a little bit out of my control right now. Hey, Jerry, uh, talk about what you did yesterday. So while we have you uh, with a good connection, uh, you went and saw DJ Sanders over at Belleville, the big defensive lineman. Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, DJ Sanders, uh, I watched him a uh, little shot put workout. They have the district meet today over at Sealy. Uh, he's thrown at 52 this year. That's a personal record for him. He actually threw at 57, but it, I, I think it got mixed up and there was a girl shot put <laughs> somewhere in there. So the 57 doesn't count as the school record. Sorry, DJ. Uh, but 52 um, is his personal record. There's 6'4", 3'12". I mean, he's got long arms, right? I mean, he's 83, 84-inch wingspan. I just actually put a lot of uh, notes and quotes on, on TexasFootball.com on DJ Sanders. 10-and-a-half-inch um, hands, right? I mean, uh, he, he's to me, he's always been a guy that uh, um going to be a couple of years in college, right? I mean, there's going to be a developmental curve with him, um, and, and, I, and I still believe that. Um, he's going to be at Texas this weekend with grandfather, brother, cousins. I mean, there's a number of family members coming in this weekend. Uh, then he'll be at, at Baylor next Tuesday, uh, April 9th. Then he's going to go up to Michigan. He has an uncle that lives in the uh, in the Detroit area. So he's going to go up and take a visit to Michigan in mid-April. Uh, and then he said he said he has his A&M visit scheduled for June 14th through 16th and Texas 21st through 23rd. Uh, so, you know, look, it, he's been to Baylor. He's been to TCU. He's been to Houston before. Um, he hasn't really been to out-of-state schools yet. Michigan will be a first trip. USC still messing around somewhere in the mix there. Um, Oklahoma a little bit as well. But I, I really – I'll be surprised if it doesn't come down to the close to homes at the end of the day for him. And and we'll see, does do, does everybody push the same? Uh, you know, do a and in Texas make the same push? 
we'll see. Uh, a lot of really good D-line prospects in the country and the state of Texas. So uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, good kid, man, country kid. Um, you know, you want – you know, construction management is what he wants to major in at the, in, in college. So he's got a plan. Uh, I do think, uh, you know, he, when he goes to college, it's not just about watching a spring practice. He actually has a little bit of a plan uh, at an early age. So it'll be, uh, um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see where it goes for him. Hey, Jerry, what about the, you, you, you passed on a tweet yesterday too. Uh, oh, yeah. on Riley Pettijan. We were telling people that you're getting ready to go out to some track meets today up in Duncanville, DeSoto area, Waxahachie. Um, this is Riley Pettijan from yesterday. Which one is he here? He's the biggest one on the left there. Uh, but, I mean, he ran 10-7-7 uh, FAT. I don't know what the wind situation. It was downwind, if you can see there, down crosswind. But 10-7-7 FAT at 220 pounds. So, even if that's a 10, 8, 2, 10, 8, 3, I mean, at 220 pounds, Bobby, that is getting to a different level as an athlete. I he's mean, the one furthest. He came yeah. in third, it looks like, in this yeah. race. Yeah, he came in third. But, I mean, Bobby, how many guys do we see at 215, 220 pounds running 10, 8? Well, I also would say this. The first 50 meters or so, he's he's up there as fast as anybody. Yes. I mean, there's, it's not going to be a lot of times where a linebacker is running 75 no. yards downfield. So if it is, your defense is bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but my point being, yeah. my point being that you know you get the guys that you want there uh in uh in stuff and 50 50 50 yards, 50 meters is plenty if you're one of the fastest out of the first 50 uh of a gate for a guy that's 220 pounds and a linebacker. Yeah, no doubt. And look, he's gonna be uh his play. I, I texted uh with Riley last night, his visit plans have not changed. He was at Ohio State last weekend. Uh, Riley Pettijon, we're talking about the four-star linebacker at McKinney. He's at USC this weekend. Then he'll be at Texas, uh, A&M, Tech, A&M April 13th, and Texas the 20th for the Texas spring game. So he hasn't changed those visit plans. Those have been set for a while. But then obviously he makes his official visit to Texas June 14th uh, through the 16th. USC uh, is on the books for an official visit. I think uh, – uh, Ohio State A&M will be as well uh, for him. But I think Texas definitely uh, definitely in that this one. They definitely have a good shot at it. And I know people say, hey, where's he leaning? What's, where's he going to go? It's April 3rd for me. Uh, let's see how this thing plays out. But uh, I think Texas uh, Texas feels confident for, you know, a good reason right now. We'll see how it plays out. All right, guys, we're going to talk some more recruiting here in just a second. We're obviously going to get to all your questions as well. But first, Bobby, can you tell us about our sponsor, Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm? Yeah, good friend Adam Lowy uh, of the Lowy Law Firm has been sponsoring uh, on Texas football for almost a, maybe more than a year now. Uh, first started talking to Adam about this time last year. Just a great guy, works hard and does right by his clients. Uh, Adam and his law firm, if you've been in, in uh, injured in a car wreck, truck wreck, uh, motorcycle accident, Adam and his group give you a free consultation uh, via phone. Uh, you just email them, look them up online, call them, uh, whatever you need to do at lowylawfirm.com. They'll give you a free consultation about whether or not they think you even deserve or may be due some compensation uh, at the outset. Uh, give them a shout, lowylawfirm.com. Thank you, Adam, for your sponsorship uh, of uh, Wednesday's Coffee and Football. Hey guys, and one other thing that we need to talk about before we get to some questions here is uh, defensive line board, Jerry. Yes, and you've been all over it over on ontexasfootball.com. I'm going to bring this graphic up and kind of just let you go down the list. Yeah, so look, there's Brandon Brown. That's the Texas commitment man. He looks good. He looks good, doesn't he? Physically, there's a, a guy at O'Galley, Florida, that was on campus March 22nd. Um, he will be back June 14th through 16th for his official visit. Uh, Tennessee, the 7th through 9th. USC currently scheduled for the 21st through 23rd. That's Brandon Brown with Sark from uh, his visit the other day. <clears throat> and then we have Josiah Sharma. Look, he was in town March 22nd, uh, last Friday, with his mom. First t- trip ever to Texas. I can say this morning, <clears throat> he's his official visit to Texas is scheduled for June 14th through 16th. Currently, Alabama, June 21st through 23rd. I really think those are the two teams right now that are kind of emerging. And that's not to say Washington won't get an official visit. Uh, He was at Oklahoma and Alabama last week before Texas. 
um, Utah could get an official visit as well. There's an Oregon. There's other suitors for Brandon. Uh, sorry for Josiah Sharma. But right now, I really think Texas and Alabama are kind of out in front there uh, with uh, Josiah Sharma. The one-time Washington commitment. Obviously, he's been to Alabama and visited there twice now. Uh, then Zion Williams, Lufkin High. He's about, you know, that 296, he's, he's eclipsed that now. He's in the Malik Autry area, about 320, 325. He'll be in April 6th with uh, – uh, with his mom, and then he'll come back June 21st through 23rd for an official visit. He'll be at LSU April 13th for their spring game. He'll make official visits to TCU, te uh, Texas A&M, and LSU. I think it's a 1A, 1B, LSU, Texas, battling out for Zion. Uh, Malik Autry is going to be in this weekend, April 6th. He's the big four-star uh, athletic defensive tackle from Opelika committed to Auburn. Yeah, I, look, that one's a tough one, but if you're going to take swings, you may as well, may as well swing at the best. Opelika, I mean, look, it's, you can drive it or walk it to the Auburn campus. It'll take you longer to walk it, but you can get there either way. Um, that's how close he is to Auburn. Uh, but you got to take swings. Autry's taking visits other places. He was at Florida last weekend. He'll be at Texas this weekend. He'll be at Oregon. He'll be at USC. So, look, it's a committed recruitment that's still – going to take visits. So Texas needs to take a swing at Malik Autry. Went over DJ Sanders. Myron Charles is a guy, as a Florida State lean, Texas really hasn't been able to crack that one. It's more Florida State, uh, Miami, Florida. Those schools are really have an advantage here. Maybe a couple, maybe a couple of the uh, other out-of-state closer schools get in. We'll see if Texas can get them on campus. That one's more of an FSU. Kevin Wynn, Texas hasn't got him on campus. Uh, and by the way, Kenny Baker will be out to see all these guys when the spring evaluation period opens up uh, at the end of April. But Kevin Wynn's not going to be an early decision as of right now. So Texas has some time uh, to kind of tinker with that one. I think Florida State and Alabama are out in front uh, of Georgia on that one. Um, and then you have Chase Sims, uh, the defensive lineman out of Richmond Randall. He'll be in this weekend as well. Chase Sims, a guy that uh, Texas likes a lot. They offered him recently. Doesn't have an official visit schedule. We'll see if that official visit gets scheduled after Saturday. And then Derry Norris is my sleeper. Derry Norris is a guy I really like at Spruce Creek out of Port Orange. Texas has offered him. Again, Kenny Baker will be out to see these guys in the spring evaluation period. But Derry Norris has an official visit to Miami June 7th through 9th. I think he has NC State as well, maybe Georgia Tech. But he's a guy who's going to continue to rise in the spring. Um, and he's an athlete uh, with a lot of physical upside, so one to watch. Uh, Jerry, any other guys? That, are, are they basically still evaluating that position? Because I'm looking yeah. at that list that you had up there. Nine guys overall, right? Yeah. Six of them from out of state. Are, are they yeah. still trying to unearth some guys in Texas? What's what's the game plan there? Yeah, I think so. I, I think the spring evaluation period is going to be big. I mean, Floyd Gidry from spring who committed to T, uh, TCU uh, last week, I believe, Texas is still going to mess with him. They're still going to watch him. Floyd Gidry's a talented kid. I, so the the key here is the D-line number is probably four, could be three, uh, it, probably four. I think the fourth guy in the class will be more of a, a, a developmental guy um, in, in terms of the runway for a guy. But that number is going to be three or four. I'm leaning to four, uh, but we'll see. So I think there's some, there's some room there for Kenny Baker when he goes out in the spring to see these guys, whether that's in Florida, whether that's in uh, Texas. Um, and there's there's going to be some other places in Georgia. There's a lot of really good D linemen in Georgia. And Georgia can only take two or three. And, uh, you know, they, there's a number uh, of really good defensive linemen in Georgia in 2025. So uh, they're, they're going to be looking at a lot of guys this uh, in May. And I, I do think we'll see at least double the official visit scheduled right now. In, in, end up with double that number by June. All right, good stuff, Jerry Hamilton. Uh, and we have a uh, we have more to talk about. Obviously, a little bit more recruiting and a couple other things that we need to touch base on. But first, guys, I want to uh, give a shout out to Jack for the super chat. He was checking in earlier. We did that during you know when we were first starting, but we never got to tell him thank you. So thank you, Jack. And then we have a super chat from Tom Doyle. He says, good evening from Guam. I've been hooked on the channel since last summer when I was working in Tokyo. Man, Tom's everywhere. Man. I really appreciate everything you guys do and the content you put out about Texas football. Hook them. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Thank you Tom, from the uh, days in in Rockdale, not exactly Guam or Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> You're, he's a little closer to the ocean than you are. 
<laughs> Although I'm, I don't know. I heard there's supposed to be a tsunami coming in Japan or something. No, they um, called it off. Called it off. They called so, it off? Okay, good. They, well, they did perfect. call it off. Yeah, it was only good. ended up being about a foot tall from what I understand. So not, not bad. I, I can handle, I, I grew up in Houston. I can handle hurricanes. I, I can handle tornadoes now. I live elsewhere, been through one. I can handle that stuff. I think I can handle just about anything. I don't want a wall of water 30 feet high coming at, coming at me. Though. That's scary. <laughs> a tsunami just doesn't sound like it'd be any fun. No. I, I can tell you from my year living in Nashville area where Bobby's at, wake, that 2 a.m. wake up call to the tornado siren is one of the worst ways to wake up, though, man. You just like, you just like pop out of bed and your mind gets in scramble mode. But that was one of the, we I don't know, Bobby. I'm sure you're you're accustomed to it by now. Uh, but, and when uh, you have when you have young kids, like oh, I yeah. did at the time, when you have young kids and you've got to get them out of bed, and your wife turns over and says and looks at you, she's so tired from having to deal with this. She looks over and says, "Don't worry, I'll fly away." She wasn't getting out of bed to go down. She's <laughs> like, "I'm just gonna fly away." So you know, it, it it's crazy, but uh, I hope everything everybody's safe and glad to hear that about but uh, about Guam. I bet he may be working for our country over yeah. there in Guam, by the way. Thank you uh, for doing that, uh, by the way. Hey, we've had some questions. I want to mention, um, because we talked about it, Trey Johnson, McDonald's game last night. I caught a little bit of that. Uh, yeah, I was going to go to it if I was in Houston, but hit the road. Um, you know, Trey Johnson, we've said this before. Trey Johnson, Texas hasn't had a 6-6 lottery pick type of shooting guard before. This guy is the best that Texas has recruited at that position. Okay, Texas has had really good point guards, obviously great ones. T.J. Ford, great one. D.J. Augustine, lottery pick, right? Um, Corey Joseph is a combo guard. Jacobin Brown is a combo. Texas had some really, really good point guards, combo guards under Rick Barnes. Texas hasn't had a shooting guard like Trey Johnson before. And I'm not – and I know the BMW days uh, of Tom Penders, but I'm just here to tell you – Trey Johnson's a little different now. And anybody that watched the McDonald's game last night saw that. He's going to be a first-round pick. He's a one-and-done. And the thing about last night, too, to consider is this 25 class, 24 class in basketball nationally is special. I mean, it's so much better than the last class, last couple of classes, not even funny. Uh, I mean, there were on the court last night, there were a number of future first round draft picks in that game. A number of guys. I mean, Ron Harper's kids at Slam Dunk. I mean, there's a lot of those guys. Ace Bailey, obviously Cooper Flag. Uh, but Trey Johnson is going to give Texas something that they haven't had before. Now, you got to put the right experience pieces around him. And Cam Scott, who wasn't in the game, who Cam Scott, I think in two years, will be a first round pick. I think Texas signed two first round picks. There are six, five, six, six guards in this class. Um, now, the key is what you're going to put around it because you're only going to have Trey Johnson one year. So that remains to be seen in the portal. Uh, but uh, Texas has some work to do in the portal. But Trey Johnson is um, – he's the most talented shoot, pure shooting guard um, who can play in the ball screen game that Texas has signed. Not even close. And he had 22 points on nine shots last yes. night. So, yes. Yes. I mean, he can, look, he is a – Complete offensive player. Um, he is a big. He has. He is an NBA shooter as a 17 year old kid. Um, obviously, his father coach played at Baylor, um, and that was the connection with Rodney Terry. Uh, but this guy's a complete game. He's a three level score. Uh, he fits the NBA game perfectly, guys. I mean, he really fits the NBA game. Uh, he can score it off the dribble. He can create space. His catch and shoots good. He has NBA range off the dribble or off the catch. He is big, big, big time player. Um, and I think he's going to be a guy that averages 15, 16, 17 as a true freshman in college basketball. Is is his arrival one of the reasons why Chris Johnson apparently is going in the portal for Texas? Um, yeah. I mean, was committed to, no, Texas, committed to Kansas, they end up at Texas. Yeah, no, I, I think that is just Texas is going to recruit a point guard in the portal. Um, you know, so I, I think that's more of just, where what what he was uh kind of what his role would be moving forward. So he wanted to be the point guard. He's like unlikely to be would have would have been unlikely to be the point guard. Yeah. And so it was a mutual decision, basically. Yeah. And then look, I mean, if you're if you're playing a combo guard at Texas next year, I mean that's gonna be tough. Trey Johnson's gonna be a 30 plus minute per game player. Um and Cam Scott's gonna play big minutes too. So 
Uh, I, th I think that was a tough spot to be in. I think he'll end up – I think Chris will transfer probably down, kind of put up some good numbers and transfer back up is what will happen with him. All right, guys. One other thing that we need to talk about before we get to the questions here is yesterday we had some questions about the Director's Cup, and we got an update on that, so I'm going to bring that up here. Um, now with 17 of the 37 complete Texas standing in second place behind Stanford. Who they seem to always be battling back and back and forth with first and second, followed by North Carolina, Notre Dame, Tennessee, and then your next five that you see there on the screen. But Texas is still in a good standing with 20 more sports to go. I, you know, a lot of those are going to be minor sports outside of basketball uh, and baseball, but uh, we'll see. I, Texas always does well in the spring sports. They're, they're doing really well. I think men's and women's tennis is on on a good path right now. Uh, golf, et cetera. So we'll we'll see where it comes out. Uh, we'll have a, a guy on that does this uh, uh, probably next week or the week after to kind of give us a feel heading into the final, after the final four, a feel of where everybody sits uh, and what we can expect from the Longhorns and see if they can recapture the Director's Cup. Uh, Longhorns won two in a row and then Stanford won last year. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. And shout out, well, well, Matt, man, Matt Brown. He, he's got it tough looking at that. He's surrounded by Texas, Tennessee, and NC State. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Before we move on, Bobby, why don't you tell folks out there about one of our newer sponsors in Autograph? Yeah, absolutely. The folks at Autograph uh, have tried to put the fans first. Uh, what they've done, guys, is created an app uh, that allows you to get rewarded for your fandom. Uh, Autograph is where real Texas fans get unreal rewards. It's the first app to track and reward fans for loving what they love most, turning passion into access and experiences. Founded on the belief that devotion should be rewarded and the future of fandom belongs to the fans. They've been sending true fans to the biggest games in college basketball for just $16. As we gear up for football season, this means you could probably score discounted tickets to marquee matchups coming up uh, to those games. Scan to download the free autograph app in the Apple Store. It's completely free. And use referral code on Texas. Check it all out. That's referral code on Texas and see where fandom takes you. That's uh, autograph the app. Thank you. Okay, y'all. Well, yeah, look, by the way, I look at that Director's Cup, and I know it's results-based, but I think if you fire a coach, a coach during one of your seasons, I think you should get like docked for that in some way. It just can't be just like results driven. There, there needs to be a little bit of a change to that. Yeah, I, I don't understand it enough, like how it all works, but I think certain sports should weigh in a lot more than others. And I don't know. I, I think they could adjust it just a little You're bit. saying the NCAA mandated sailing championship shouldn't count as much as men's football? Yeah, I mean, yeah, no offense to I, I, agree. <laughs> I, I, I think we all agree that you could wrap up about 15 sports. No offense to the people participating in those sports and, and the young people giving everything they've got and the coaches and everything. But I mean, let's get real, yeah. you know, 100 percent or less competitive than others. All right, y'all. Well, let's take some questions here. And uh, let's start with this one from Jay Dobbs. We're going to go back to Ryan Wingo and Sark and what we were talking about earlier. Jay Dobbs says, Wait. A friend asked me yesterday if Sark praised Wingo to motivate the other receivers or other freshmen. I said, and then he glitched, so give me a second. I said that I told my buddy that I didn't think Sark played games with praise. Your thoughts? Zero. He doesn't. I, he may do that just like every coach does to a degree but his when you're asked point blank who's been standing out and you say ryan wingo you're talking about out of 85 guys he's not playing games with every single position he said ryan wingo and trey wiseman i'm, I'm just I'm, I'm look anybody that says that doesn't get it when you talk about ryan wingo um he he also said it over Colin Simmons, if you think about it that way. It wasn't over another receiver. It was over everybody. It was over Brandon Baker at offensive tackle. It, guys, when I told you I walked away from that first practice and yeah. I said, this is the dude or this is a dude that Texas has, I wasn't 
I didn't say anything. I wasn't saying, oh, it's over anybody else. It's just, this is a dude. Now, my question to Jerry's is, how how well is he going to be schooled and ready to go? But the first time y'all see him in a Texas uniform on most likely April 20th, right, you will understand. I'm not I'm not wrong about this, right? I, it's, uh, when you see him, you'll get it just like you got it with Anthony Hill. I mean, did anybody question that Anthony Hill was a different type of guy the first time they saw him? No. And by, and by the way, um, I think when Sark started praising C.J. Baxter last year, I mean, look what meaning that did have. Yeah. He, he I mean, by the him. way, he, look at the meaning that did have when Sark spoke about him. How and about – hey, Jerry, how about C.J. Baxter? So Texas had the number one running back in 2022 in B. John Robinson. Yeah. Um, 23, 23 draft. It looks like Texas is going to have the number one back in the 24 draft. Right now, people have uh, Jonathan Brooks going in the top 50 and the number one running back off the board. What what does it say if Cedric Baxter was actually ahead of him last year? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, mean, think, I want you to think about that. Does Texas have another 1-1 one, one back, another uh, top running back coming out? I, I, do know that, I do know that on the 40 acres they think Cedric Baxter can be – a big time guy. Uh, and I think they're starting to see more of that. The body's stronger this year. Um, there's more you know, quicker decisions, maybe right there. The one thing about being a taller running back to me in high school, you're so good that you still don't take a lot of direct shots, right? That really impact you. DeAndre Robinson got him once and told us about it on, on Texas football. But look, you don't take many shot shots because you're such a good player. Um, he had a minor hamstring issue, but that wasn't from – that was just – that's a non-contact deal, right? But last year as a freshman running back in college, when you have that taller, longer body, you, you, you take shots. You took real shots for the first time over a course of a season. Uh, so that's one of the things that I think you're going to see quicker decisions with him and eyes up post-contact more consistently. That's one of the things he did very well early uh, to really impress the Texas coaches. He kept his eyes up after first contact. Now it's keeping eyes up after multiple contacts to finish all those runs. So I think Cedric Baxter is going to make a big jump this year, guys. I'm on record. I really do. I, I will add this. Um, Jerry mentioned this quicker decision-making. I, I Someone gave me the term uh, after Friday's practice. We said that he had a uh, – said Baxter – uh, apparently had a great practice on Friday. Decisive yeah, was the term. He's much more decisive uh, this year than he was a year ago. Last year, he was uh, kind of thinking about things a little bit as a runner. And I think it looked like that at times. Now he's become much more decisive. We'll see if how that plays in the spring game. But uh, I think uh, a lot of people on the 40 acres really excited about Cedric Baxter, as well as the running back room as, as a whole. We haven't even mentioned Trey Wisner and what Sark said about him yesterday yet, Jerry. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sark saying Wisner is maybe one of the hardest workers on the team. And he's worked himself into a role on this football team. So people thinking that, uh, I don't know, Christian Clark or uh, Jarrett Gibson may just bypass him. I, I can see a situation where Jaden Blue tries to go pro after this year and Wisner takes that role going forward after this year but in the interim he kind of plays that keelan robinson role uh that texas has uh that sark uh, utilized so well i mean it, look a lot of just positive praise on wisner and um wisner and, and wingo i will add this if he talks about wisner that way who's he trying to you know if people are saying oh sark's just trying to get at other people who's he trying to get at there nobody i know of so i Sark's not trying to get at people in these conversations, maybe slightly every so often, but with Ryan Wingo, I think he's just cut different, guys. Yeah. Hey, by the way, Isaiah Stewart's got a great question at 845. That's a great topic, and I think it's a great question. All right. We'll talk about it. Isaiah Stewart asks, what are the characteristics of a great coach outside of results? And do you all think Sark is becoming an elite coach in college football? So I think it's different from college 
to the NFL because it's di- it's just it, it's a different model, right? Um, it's becoming closer to the same. But so one of the things I look for when a coach is hired, do they know who to hire on their staff to maximize their job that they just got? And one of the things with Sark is I think he's he he when he was hired, I thought his initial staff. I mean, everybody's gonna have say, well, one guy at some position, right? But I, I thought his initial hires um were were pretty strong at texas i thought he had a full understanding of the texas job when he made the hires he made and where texas was headed sec and he wanted to have his footprint in california and arizona uh so i think that recruiting along i-10 uh, you know i thought obviously jeff banks coming with him was a no-brainer uh but and kyle flood was going to come with him right um but i mean bo davis terry joseph uh, keeping Brandon Harris. I mean, Louisiana, that Southeast region, right? Then when Stan Drayton got a job, just a hard choice hire, maximizing recruiting um, at the running back position, but also Florida. He's the Orlando and Southwest Corridor recruiter uh, of wherever he went at Georgia Tech. He'd been recruiting those guys for years. That's why one of the big reasons Cedric Baxter came to Texas, right? So that helps you get into Florida. Um, I think that also helps you get some foot in the door in Georgia. Now the Kenny Baker hire helps you more in Georgia along with the Shard Choice. It's hard to work one on 50 in the state of Georgia, okay? So you have Kenny Baker now. So I think Sark has shown the signs. And Johnny Nance, I think, was a tremendous hire for your West Coast footprint, all that stuff. So I think Sark's shown a real understanding of how to maximize the job from a hiring perspective. And that's always number one with me, Bobby. Then it gets every then it gets into everything else. But if you're if a coach is hired and he gets his dream job or a blue blood job, and early on he doesn't show the signs of knowing who to hire, then you're in trouble. And just go back and look at the history. You're in trouble. So Sark actually knew who to hire. That was a great start for him. And he's known who to the next round of hires have been really good ones to help maximize the program. Yeah, staff construction and who are your lieutenants are a big piece of any organization. So I I would agree with that. I think he's done a particularly good job of replacing guys. Like uh, he wanted somebody younger at defensive line coach, Kenny Baker, right? He wanted somebody with more West Coast ties than maybe Jeff Choate, who had more, you know, that, you know, Nevada, Montana, Colorado. He wanted more true West Coast ties. He got that with Johnny Nansen. Yeah, I think he upgraded with Tashar Choice over Stan Drayton, although you could argue that Stan Drayton's one of the better uh, coaches Texas has had at, at the running back position. So, uh, But when it, you talk about what qualities a coach has, it's really, I go back to what a leader has. A great leader is consistent, in my opinion. You know what you get from them every day because they're themselves. They're not trying to be somebody different. It doesn't mean they're perfect, but they're consistent each and every day. And then they hold others accountable to that consistency. So you don't just wake up one day and become a better uh, guy working stuff, working out. You have to hold people accountable over time so they can build on it month after month after month. That's how you get development within your program. So I'm all about consistency from elite leaders. I mean, you can say what you want about Nick Saban, whether he's a, a jerk or to other people or how it go, goes about it. But Nick Saban's himself, right? He he was himself the whole way, stayed true to what he did, and he was rewarded for it. So outside of results, I mean, I, I think consistency is huge because at least then everybody under you, the whole organization knows what to expect from the man in charge. And then they can go out and do their jobs. They don't have to worry about you doing yours. So I I, I like that uh, aspect of a leader and, and think that that's really, really uh, important. And, and I th- I, the other thing I think is so important right now, especially in college sports, is you better be genuine. You are not going to fake it and make it in college athletics anymore. No chance when it, these kids and these families – can go to YouTube, can go to social media and found, find every press conference you've had. You there's you better be genuine or you're going to get caught. No doubt, and you can't fake it. 
It, it, it can't be fake genuineness. Kids see right through that now. Texas, uh, th that was the biggest, to me, the biggest change I've seen at Texas now from last coach to this coach um, is a, this is a real genuineness. And that really matters uh, with trust of players and families of players. You can't, you can't fake it. You're going to get popped. All right, y'all, this next question here is actually uh, from Twitter. And Dak says, any word on Trey Moore? Yeah, Texas got somebody. <laughs> yes. that, let's, uh, if, you know, if Dax hasn't been tuned in. Uh, so behind the scenes, beginning really in late January, uh, Jerry and I uh, and even CJ started hearing things from the building uh, Mockery Newhouse that uh, Trey Moore was just was just a little bit different than other newcomers from a seriousness um, and dedication standpoint. Like he takes it to another level, um, which makes sense if you think about it. He's undersized a little bit, right, Jerry? Yeah. Um, he's not, you know, the ideal arm length, etc. Yet he's hyper productive. Fourteen and a half sacks. Um, and Jerry, Jerry made the comment, this is a guy that is not only going to play a lot and he's super quick, by the way, like surprisingly kind of deathly quick. Um, this is a guy that's a transfer that people are thinking highly enough inside the building that he actually might be a captain for the team. Not, and this isn't a quarterback like Sam Hartman at Notre Dame goes from Wake right. Forest. The Notre Dame becomes this is a defensive end edge yeah. that that is fighting for a starting spot, but he already has gained in two months, three months, enough respect about how he goes about his business that he might be a, a, a captain. I mean, that should Dax, that should tell you enough about what you're getting. The question I have, and, and you know, take away all the leadership stuff is. How successful is he going to be when he goes up against the bigger guys? Right now, in practice, he is being very productive. Okay? Texas has a good offensive line, guys. So, if that's able to carry forward to the SEC, um, I think Texas, he could end up being the best player Texas got out of the portal. More, more notoriety for Andrew Makuba, Isaiah Bond, Matthew Golden. Trey Moore might be uh, the best player Texas got out of the portal. Player, not prospect, but player. And, and I'll say this, Trey Moore is playing to the level where, look, he can – he's not hes not just an edge coming off the, uh, you know, off the line of scrimmage. There, you can play him with Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke. Uh, you can play more of that three-man front and have him on the field with Sorrell and Burke. That's the level player I think Trey Moore it has become quickly at Texas. All right, guys. Well, you're watching Coffee and Football presented by Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. I want to thank them for sponsoring today's show. By the way, if you haven't already, please hit that like button and then the subscribe button as well. We would appreciate it. We went over 40,000 subscribers recently. Can't thank you guys enough for that. So please, if you haven't, do that and then ring the bell so you're notified anytime that we go live or post a video. That way you don't miss anything and you get all the latest and uh, great news. Or hopefully it's great anyway. Uh, <laughs> this next question here from uh, on TexasFootball.com, the forums, and it's from Wadi7796. He says, have any of the interior defensive linemen started to rise to the top, specifically the zero and three tech guys that we are going to need? Yeah, I think uh, I think Savea is a, a, a quality player, uh, guys. I, I think look, he's he was a productive player at Arizona, multi-year starter. Arizona, good team, ten-win team, uh, good defensive team. Obviously, Johnny Nansen uh, thinks very highly of him. He's brought him from UCLA to Arizona to Texas, right? So, I mean, that that tells you something right there uh, when you take a guy with you twice. Uh, but I, I think Savea has shown well this spring. Um, I, I think look, the big thing for me, Bobby, is. Is um, you know I think Alex January for a young kid is, is doing some good things, but again it's going to be it's good. and I think Vernon Broughton is a disruptor. Is it, he's now bigger, right? He's three hundred five pounds. He's ten pounds up as a disruptor. He's never going to be an anchor guy, but he's going to 
if he can maximize what he does well, that helps. But I, I really think, you know, what is Dre Bledsoe? What are, what are we hearing about him after spring? Um, and again, we're midway through this, right? And uh, so, but I think right now, Savea is the one um, guy that is. That's a zero that ain't. Yeah, he's shown he can handle a lot of snaps, maybe. What about Alfred Collins? Because I've heard some positive things there. Fair. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't even mention him. Like, Alfred Collins is the given. I think he's the easily the most talented guy. Maybe not easily. Dre Bledsoe, pound for pound, maybe the best athlete in the program. But as far as guys that have played a lot, uh, I think Alfred Collins is, is a guy. He's You know, he's a full-time starter, big snap player, uh, major snap player. But I, I think Savea uh, is going to quietly – uh, work his way into being a good player at Texas, from what I hear. Interesting. All right, guys, this next question here is going to come from Chant Bailey 3. Jerry, I, I know you got to get out of here soon. You got to hit the road for recruiting. So I'm going to ask you a couple of recruiting questions yeah. before we let you go. Chant Bailey 3 says, Jerry, help me understand Riley Pettijohn's game better. Who is a good comparison that you would give for him? Ooh, I haven't thought of a player comp. I'll think about that. But, you know, look, I, what I like about Pettijohn is he's, he, he's an instinctive linebacker. He's a smart linebacker. I mean, he could play middle. I'm not sure that's what he plays, uh, but he, he has that versatility. You can do a lot of things with him. He can play. He can drop in coverage. Obviously, he's a really good athlete. He can pursue the ball. He's got range. He can blitz. He's kind of a total package linebacker. I think teams will, I think college programs will lean to playing him more outside, but that's not to say he couldn't play Mike and make all your calls for you. I think that's what his strength is, guys. I, I think he can. he's so scheme versatile. Uh, because he has the instincts for the position, he has the he has the football IQ. Uh, but you know, I think his speed, his range, his ability to drop in coverage. I mean, so think about if he's a six three, two hundred twenty pound, uh, faster version of thing, same things you hear about Leon Lafau, right? I mean, think about it maybe in that terms. I'm not comparing him as a player. I'm just saying what we some of the things you hear about Lafau. Uh, I think Riley Pettijohn is a, is going to be a complete linebacker at the next level and a guy that you can play about anywhere within your scheme, and he's going to be productive. But I love – here's the thing I love most about Riley Pettijohn. We had Nathan Daughtry on here uh, the tra who trains him. He trained uh, Xavier Filsamy and Zena. And he puts out a lot of videos with Pettijohn. Riley Pettijohn is not going to be outworked. He is not going to be outworked. And that's the number one thing. It's one thing to have his talent. It's another thing to be the worker he is. And that's why I, I mean, that's why I don't have any doubts that Riley Pettijohn is going to maximize his talent. And if a guy that talented maximizes it, he, he there, there's a good chance he's going to have a career in football. All right. And then uh, I'm going to, you know, we've had a lot of people join since we talked about defensive tackle recruiting earlier. I'm going to bring that graphic back up yeah, here yeah. for a second. But David Williams says, Jerry, my view about Zion Williams and his interest in LSU causes me to go back and forth on whether he or, or Josiah Sharma is the better nose tackle option to play off Brandon Brown at defensive tackle. So can you touch on that and then maybe reiterate uh, the recruiting news or, you know, where these yeah. guys stand on this graphic I'm bringing up? Yeah, yeah. So I think so. I, one of the things I think make Brandon Brown and, and Josiah Sharma such high, high end prospects, and they, they have a little different skill set. I think they can be either one can play over the ball, can play a, 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 a tilt, as Sean Rogers called it when he was on there, or can play a three. I, 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 both those guys have that versatility. Zion Williams is an over the ball player in the SEC. I, I, I think that's what all the teams that have offered him kind of see him at. Um, and he, he's not as twitchy as Brown or Sharma or Malik Autry, but he is a strong presence over the ball. Uh, so I, I think Sharma and, and Zion can play, uh, Sharma and Brandon Brown can play anywhere along the defensive front. And I think that's one of the things that makes those uh, guys two of the best I've seen in this class. Uh, but I think Zion's an over the ball player. I think when you look at uh, DJ Sanders, I was at Belleville yesterday. He'll be on campus with most of his family Saturday. He, he may take a little longer in that developmental process. Um, he's more of an, I don't think, see him playing over the ball, um, I, either, whether that's at AM, whether that's at Texas, I don't see him playing over the ball. Uh, the over the ball players on this list to me, at, when you consider Brown and Sharma could do either, is Zion Williams. Malik Autry could, but he's also so athletic. He's got enough twitch. He can play anywhere. Um, and the, the, Kevin Wynn is an over the ball player. I think Chase Sims will develop into an over the ball player long term. Um, and Derry Norris. I think that guy's more of a three-five type of player. Uh, so that's kind of the way I see those guys lining up right now. Myron Charles uh, is more of a three guy for me. 
Uh, probably going to go to FSU, but that's the board right now. And I, I went over that earlier in the show if you missed it. All right, man. Bobby, you have any thoughts on that? I know you've watched a lot of those guys. Uh, so I, I'm a little bit different. I, I like Sharma as a as a tilt player primarily. Um, I, I And I like Brown as a three. Um, but my, my big takeaway on it, again, and I mentioned this earlier as well, You've got nine guys up there, Jerry, that you yeah. listed. And I know you put some time into that list and, and have some insight, et cetera. Six of them are from out of state. That That's my big takeaway. That's where Texas is headed. And I mean, all, and I said this yesterday as well, both coasts from yeah. Melbourne, Florida to, you know, Folsom, yeah. California, um, and parts in between, and only three Texans. So, I, I'll be surprised if a new guy doesn't uh, pop up in the state of Texas um, down the road. But I like where Texas is headed with defensive line recruiting right now because I think um, I think they're going to they're they're going whale hunting. You know, they're not looking for for small fish right now that they can build up. I think they're going to try to to attack defensive line recruiting a little bit differently. Or they are, excuse me, not they're going to try. They are attacking. Defensive line recruiting different this year than they did under Bo Davis. Doesn't mean that one is right, one is wrong, but they're going after bigger fish this year at defensive line. In my and, and this is one thing I want I want to say before I got to get out of here. And by, by the way, Edmund Lee, thank you very much for that super chat. I think Ski Barrett's got a great question. Uh, here's the thing to, to know with a Josiah Sharma: How talented is Josiah Sharma out in the Sacramento area at Folsom? Georgia offered him. And Kalen DeBoer had him committed at Washington. And since he got to Alabama, he's still a top target for them. When Georgia and Alabama, there's a ton of elite defensive linemen from Louisiana east of Florida up into the Carolinas. If they're going to go to California and NorCal to recruit a D-tackle, they think that guy could be a first or second round pick. Bottom line, no doubt about it. And I say that to lead into this. One of the more intriguing edge prospects that Texas is on is Hayden Lowe out of Oaks Christian there in Westlake Village, California. And I, I said a couple of college coaches on the West Coast think he could end up being better than Kayvon Thibodeau one day. And the first time I heard that, I was like, whoa, Kayvon Thibodeau is the number one player in the country and a first-round pick. And they said one day, not in high school. But I said that to say this. Hayden Lowe will be at Texas this weekend and in June 14th, 16th for an official visit. He's go Georgia scheduled him for an official visit in mid-May. How many edge prospects does Georgia pass over to get to a kid in Southern California? Texas is in on the right guys. I said all that long-winded to say this. Texas is in on the right guys. They're casting the net that they need. Now you just got to go out and win a few. Could be the two best defensive linemen, one an edge and one a defensive tackle in the state of California. Yeah. That, that's the bottom line. To give you an example of, uh, you know, that's that's high cotton in my opinion. All right, guys. Hey, I got to get out of here. I got to go hit the hit a little hit a little district track meet to see a uh, a kid that we'll talk about tomorrow a little bit. Uh, a kid that's going to visit Texas soon that I haven't seen in person. I want to see him in person before he visits because he's kind of been a spring riser. And then uh, I'll be uh, off to uh, uh, the, south of Dallas for the uh, Duncanville, DeSoto, Dallas Skyline that district track meet, which I'm not sure I'm fast enough to even be allowed to be in there. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I can't. I can't wait to watch the competition. And I think that competition starts way beyond, uh, way before they actually get step foot on the track. That competition starts when they get on the bus. Hey, so that, that's going to be one of the better tra district track meets to go to. Hey, uh, you Jerry, have a good day. Jerry, you don't have to be that fast. Just make sure your camera is. No, I have to be fast enough to ch chase those guys around and get photos, man. I mean, like, I, I, I fully suspect I have a hamstring cramp at three in the morning in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, thank right. you, buddy. Thank you, Jerry. Y'all have a good one. All right. Uh, All right, Bobby. Well, he is such uh, a treasure. Yes, no doubt about it. I want to read this super chat here from Edmund Lee, Bobby. A big, big thank you to Edmund Lee. Big super chat from him. He says, on Texas football is the best UT information program, 40.4. A uh, thousand subscribers and growing. Here's some funds for the spring game refreshments and jerky for Jerry, of course. Hook'em horns ready for the spring game and the SEC season. 
Well, I, I can tell you guys, uh, so we do have a little bit of an announcement here. On uh, this day of the spring game, we're going to be at a place called the Victory Lap at 11 a.m. Uh, for the spring game uh, for a pregame uh, get-together as well as a live uh, before the pregame. We're going to be doing that on the show along with myself, Rod Babers. I think CJ and Jerry are going to uh, join, it as, uh, join us as well. Uh, the Victory Lap is right across, if you're familiar with the UT campus, right across from the Castilian. Uh, we'll do a live there from 11 to 12 and then walk over to the stadium uh, prior to the one o'clock kickoff for the spring game. Uh, please join us there. I'm also working on doing a little get together for folks in and around the Austin area. Uh, earlier that week when I'm in town, I want to buy everybody a beer if I can. Uh, I got to see if that's legal and everything with the people I'm talking to. Uh, but we'll get that set up here in the next week or so. Uh, and hopefully everybody can join us and just come out and have a little on Texas football fun, talk some football. Hang out with uh, some Longhorn fans. All right, well, we got a couple more things to talk about before we get out of here, Bobby. But first, can you talk about Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm? Yeah, absolutely. Adam has uh, been very successful with what he's been doing for a long period of time. Two de decades plus experience in the Austin area, helping injured Texans uh, if they've been injured in a car wreck, motorcycle, RV, ATV wrecks or big, big ones uh, right now. Uh, and if you think you might be due compensation because of the negligence of another party, uh, be it the actual automobile itself or another person, give Adam and his group a call uh, or reach out to them at LoweyLawFirm.com. LoweyLawFirm.com. What they do is they give a free consultation, no strings attached. Uh, give them a call. They'll let you know whether or not they think you're due compensation as well. Adam, thank you for your sponsorship, bud. Yeah, thank you for sponsoring each and every Wednesday right here on Coffee and Football. All right, Bobby. So I, I got something that, that they've been talking about in the chat a little bit, and uh, I want to get your opinion on it, and then we'll use it to lead into our last one. But Kelly at Horns Up says, is OU destined to be the next A&M in the SEC? And let's look at their schedule in year one here. I'm going to bring it up for you. And what are your expectations for the Sooners in year one? Well, I think they'll be three and zero going into non going into conference play. Um, they get Tennessee at home to start their SEC. I think. Four I think Tennessee. Yeah, I, I think. Look, I. The bigger question isn't necessarily this one. It, it isn't necessarily whether it's this season or next. Uh, I think they'll lose to Alabama, LSU, Missouri, Ole Miss. In Texas, out of that group, that's five. Yeah, this I'm just telling you now. So, you know whether that actually comes to pass, we'll see. But I think it's gonna be tough for them in year one. They they are a year away, I think, from actually being their best selves. Um. Uh, so, uh, with Jackson Arnold having a full year of, of uh, uh, behind center with a new offense coming in all of that stuff. And they've got some really good young players on defense and are getting better. And they've got Stutzman coming back. Bowman is really good, but they just don't have that whole entire piece. Um, so I think the bigger issue for me for OU overall is when they were in the big 12 or in the big eight, they could be the big boy on the block and go recruit nationally. Um, they can still try to do that. I just don't know that they're going to be necessarily situated differently than an Alabama, an LSU, a Georgia, a Florida, et cetera. And they don't have a ton of in-state talent. So they have to reach outside the state boundary a lot. Um, I would worry a little bit, and it's not A&M that they would become. I would worry if they're the next Arkansas in the SEC. Because Arkansas is a state somewhat similar in that they don't have a lot of um, internal talent in their state boundaries. Texas A&M and Texas are always going to have a lot of in-state players. Um, and Arkansas, for those who don't know, I mean, Arkansas in the 60s and 70s was one of the best programs in the country. They went to they, they kind of faded a little bit at the end of uh, the S uh, Southwest Conference. Um, but I want to add this. They still had some national run. And then when they went to the SEC, they became an afterthought. Or they have become an afterthought to many. Um, 
I would, and I think OU clearly has a better tradition than Arkansas does. So I'm not debating that, but that would be my concern if I'm an OU fan. I don't want to become the next Arkansas because Arkansas right now has to fight to win eight, eight games every year, seven games. You don't want OU doesn't want to become Arkansas. It's not AM, it's Arkansas. That's the comparison, in my opinion. And I, and you know, A and M still has highs. I mean, it's just not as high as a lot of teams, but that's that's it. And then that leads me to our last question for today, and it's from Ski Brick. And he says, Who are the possible breakout programs this year? Ole Miss, LSU, Notre Dame, and who's maybe your surprise early Heisman candidate? I love how you say Notre Dame. I love it, Blake. <laughs> Notre Dame. You're like old school. Um, okay. I would say this. Uh Notre Dame has a chance with Riley Leonard at quarterback. And he is, if I were to pick a surprise Heisman early favorite, it would be him. Uh, Bobby Petronic says Old Miss. Some other people have that, them as well. I agree with that. My, my question on Old Miss is, um, you know, Jackson Dart has been hit or miss for me. Mm-hmm. Um, really good quarterback. Is he improving at a rate that you want to see him to be a national championship quarterback? And I don't know, or even a Heisman winning quarterback. I don't know. We'll see. Um, I don't know that I have a, a what I would call a, a, a long shot for Heisman. Uh, I think Riley Leonard would be a good one. Uh, Quinn Ewer is obviously going to be in that conversation. Uh, my thought process right now is I think – Ohio State and Georgia are the two most talented teams in the country. I think Texas, uh, uh, Alabama, LSU, uh, probably Michigan, and maybe Oregon are that next group of most talented teams. So Notre Dame's in there as well. Throw those all together. What are your thoughts on Missouri? A lot of, you know, they're in a lot of top tens on the way too early. I mean, they lose their defensive coordinator and Blake Baker. They've lost some key pieces there. Do you see them doing well in the SEC this year? Who, who's that again? I'm sorry. I just got a, we just got a text. <laughs> we just got a text about Landon Rink to the yes. to Texas A&M. The, Texas uh, the, A&M. the son of uh, Shane Rink. Uh, you'll notice in a lot of people say, what, what happened? Shane played for Texas. Now his son from Cypher is going to A&M. On that list that Jerry put up not 15 minutes ago, Shane Rink or Landon Rink wasn't on there because Texas hadn't prioritized him. Correct. So don't say this is a direct win, yada, yada, yada. And Landon Rink is a good player. But Texas is looking for a little bit bigger guy. Remember when I said they're looking for bigger fish this year? A year ago, they would have prioritized Landon Rink and likely would have gotten him. Um, different different stage now. They're trying to get bigger fish. They're trying to get a lot bigger guys in the middle. Yeah, it's funny you say that about the win because on Twitter, you know, on social media, they're already saying, "Oh, big big head to head win." And yeah, yeah, that no, narrative it, it, is already okay. out there. Sure, they are, but we yeah. just look. Texas hasn't been prioritizing him yeah. or di- prioritizing him since January, and that's just how it is. I mean, he went to. A Texas Junior Day uh, in January wasn't treated maybe as as highly as some other guys, and that was not a mistake. Texas didn't mess up the recruitment; they just felt differently about him than maybe some other schools did. Yeah, I mean, think I mean, when's the last time we really even reported on him over yeah. it on Texas football? That right there should tell you quite a bit. So. Yeah. All right, Bobby. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of Coffee and Football presented by Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. We want to thank them for sponsoring along with Autograph. Bobby, what, what's the plan for later today? Anything coming up on the pipeline, whether here or on the website? Well, obviously, Jerry's out and about right now uh, following some recruiting stuff. He's got two different stops today. CJ Vogel and I will be doing the state of the program later, and then uh, we'll be back tonight uh, with the uh, live stream. On TexasFootball.com, we've got a couple of different articles coming out today, uh, one of which covering the offense uh, and how they're doing thus far in spring ball, uh, mentioning, uh, talking a little bit about Hayden Connor and Nato Umiozulu in that battle for the left guard spot uh, as well. 
Uh, as always, thank you all for joining us on Coffee and Football. We appreciate you guys. I uh, hope you enjoy your, the rest of your week here. That's right. Thank you all for tuning in. Again, if you haven't already, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us and it helps you stay in touch and in tune with all the latest breaking news uh, that comes from the Longhorns and then ring the bell, of course, so you're notified when that news happens or when we post the video. And for Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you tomorrow morning. Hook up. <laughs>